head of the NPT PrepCom. I'm very grateful you could uh, give up your lunch time to come and hear us talk about working methods in disarmament diplomacy. This is part three of a series we've had at the Geneva Disarmament Platform. Um, the first part was about the concept of consensus in disarmament diplomacy. The second part was on the phenomenon of the general debate, which we witnessed uh, last week here at the NPT. And today we're looking at the third and final part, which is on preparatory processes. Um, and you may have seen the photo on, on the flyer, which indicates what some of us think about preparatory processes, that they're kind of a bit of a yawn. Um, but they are there for a reason. And um, they supposedly serve a purpose. So what we'd like to talk about today is why do we have preparatory processes? What are they for? Or what are they supposed to be for? Um, do they fulfill that purpose uh, in practice? And if not, um, no spoiler, I mean, we think they probably don't fulfill that purpose terribly well at the moment. Um, if they don't fulfill that purpose, then how could, uh, how could we improve them? Uh, do we need to have preparatory processes? Is there another way of, of achieving the, what these processes are meant to achieve um, that is perhaps not quite so, so tedious? So, um, firstly, I should say, introduce myself. For those who don't know me, I'm Richard Lenane, and I'm the director of the Geneva Disarmament Platform. And we organize these kinds of events, which we hope will get diplomats and others involved in multilateral disarmament diplomacy to think a little bit differently about, about your work and the way you, you do things. Um, and also get beyond um, looking at issues just in terms of nuclear weapons or small arms or this treaty or that forum, um, but to look at some cross-cutting uh, cross issues. So I'm very uh, privileged to have uh, two good friends with me on the podium today to, to, to make this discussion work. First on my left is Alison Pitlack, who um, I'm sure many of you know. She's a program consultant for Reaching Critical Will, which is um, the disarmament branch, I guess, of the department of the <laughs> Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, uh, which is a very um, well-respected and old, what, 103 years now, mm -hmm. uh, old uh, organization working for, for peace and disarmament. Um, Alison uh, has been working hard this past two weeks at the NPT, um, doing Reaching Critical Will's work on uh, monitoring the discussions and reporting regularly on them. I'm sure you've seen her are they daily or mm, semi-daily reports? And <laughs> clusterish reports uh, coming out. Um, and Alison previously worked uh, with other NGOs, most notably Control Arms. So um, Alison has a lot of experience in various kinds of preparatory processes. Not just experience of you know, not not like a diplomat where you just waltz in and you make a statement and you go back to the coffee lounge. But Alison actually has to sit through them and take notes and listen to what everyone's saying. So um, I, I, I'm very pleased we really couldn't have anyone better qualified to, to talk uh, about preparatory processes, except perhaps for the gentleman on my right. <laughs> Daniel Figgs uh, is chief of the implementation support unit of the Biological Weapons Convention. Um, so he looks after the, the meetings and preparatory processes for, for that treaty. Uh, previously, Daniel worked at the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons in The Hague, uh, and also there had some uh, <laughs> gruesome experiences with, uh, with preparatory processes for review conferences of the Chemical Weapons Convention. So uh, between them, both uh, Alison and Daniel, uh, a lot of experience, uh, sort of hands-on, uh, really brutal experience with preparatory processes. And I, I think what we might do, we're not going to have sort of speeches or long statements or, or PowerPoint presentations. I'm just going to ask them questions. It's a bit like a TV chat show. And uh, we'll, see, we'll see where the discussion takes us. And once, once I've asked a few questions of our panellists, um, we'll open it up and, and you can have a go at asking questions or making comments uh, from the floor. Um, and that's, that's how we do it, very informally. Don't be shy, uh, just, just jump in. But if I can start with you, Alison, uh, mm. since you're fresh from suffering through a preparatory process, um, could you just give a brief outline of you know, what are they for, what are they supposed to do, what's your view of, of a prep call? Well, <laughs> I think as, as the name implies, they are meant to uh, sort of set the groundwork and prepare uh, states' parties to different treaties, to different agreements, um, to, to move forward to another type of meeting, usually a review conference. So 
Um, maybe for those who are a bit less familiar with the NPT, there are always uh, two preparatory committees leading up to, uh, sorry, three preparatory committees leading up to a review conference. Um, other agreements sort of have different arrangements. Um, often these are places where you can, you know, exchange views, set out opinions on issues of the treaty, a treaty's implementation that are particularly salient or controversial at that point in that instrument's uh, history. Um, sometimes they can be places for taking decisions, sometimes they are not. Um, I think it, it really sort of depends a bit on the instrument in question and, and the nature of the environment in which that instrument operates on how effective they are and how much actual preparation they give in the lead up to the big show uh, at the end of that process. Thanks. Okay. Daniel, your view? Um, thanks, Richard, and thanks for the invitation to be here as well, and thanks to all of you for spending your, your final lunchtime of the MPT PrepCon to, to be here as well and to talk about what you've already <laughs> described. As a, I'm, I'm amazed there's so many of you here, actually, when you've had the flyer with the people yawning on the front. <laughs> so, so that's great. So thank you all for being here. Um, like Richard said, I've been involved. I have never been involved in NPT um, review conference or pre PrepCons or anything like that, but I have been involved in the BWC and the CWC from both the inside and the outside. I was an NGO observer to a couple of CWC and BWC review conferences, and then also working for the OPCW for the third CWC review conference, and then here in Geneva for the eighth review conference of the BWC back in 2016. So, you know, I've got that kind of experience of, from both sides. Um, one thing I think is, is useful to do is to look, you know, see what's the purpose. The preparatory process is obviously preparing for something. So what's the purpose of the review conferences as well? Where do the idea of reviewing treaties come from? I mean, it's interesting when you look into this that the, the first, the, the kind of concept of a conference to review a treaty seems to go back to at least the UN Charter negotiations in 1945. If you look at Article um, 109 of the UN Charter, that calls for a general conference to review the UN Charter 10 years after it entered into force. Now that conference never took place, hasn't yet taken place, um, but that was something that was copied into other treaties, including arms control, including disarmament treaties as well. The Antarctic Treaty, the Seabed Treaty, obviously the NPT, um, Biological Weapons Convention and Chemical Weapons Convention and, and others as well. And you know, there's various functions and probably each conference, each convention has, you know, different functions for its its review conferences, but they all, I think, would share this kind of um, approach that they're meant to be a more strategic, a more kind of political meeting rather than sort of operational or technical that generally happen every five years. It's more of a stock-taking exercise. Obviously, as the name implies, they look back and what's happened, review what's happened in the past, but always with a kind of a forward-looking connotation as well. Um, also, various functions, and again, speaking from the point of view of the Biological Weapons Convention, it's very important to reaffirm um, previous commitments, previous review conference agreements, uh, to kind of help the treaty evolve, you know, depending on new challenges, um, to kind of guide implementation to the extent that that's possible at the review conferences to um, basically look after the treaty, this role of kind of treaty stewardship in some ways for a review conference as well as the kind of the guardian of, of the treaty. Now obviously that depends on whether there's a big organisation for the treaty as well that plays that role or whether the review conferences are kind of standalone, more like is the case with the MPT and the, and the BWC as well, as well, where you do not have a big organization behind them. So I think you know, the, the preparatory processes, like I said, they're obviously preparing for the, the, the main event itself, this thing that takes place every five years, but they're also very much dependent on the context in which that preparatory process and that review conference takes place. My experience at OPCW is very different from the experience here with the BWC and probably also the NBT, where you do not have a big continuously operating institution like you do for the CWC in The Hague, but yeah, I mean, perhaps we can touch on some of those issues again with the next next questions. Well, let's 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 come straight back to that. I mean, how what are some of the differences? Because I'm thinking of, uh, for example, in the BWC, uh, at least until the most recent review conference, the preparatory process was absolutely it was quite minimal. It was just uh, I think a three day 
meeting, and it did only administrative stuff like like working out the agenda and who was going to be which chairing which committee and this kind of thing. Um, whereas I also recall the Chemical Weapons Convention had quite an extensive and very detailed preparatory process, uh, and the one I recall actually went very badly wrong and that was then kind of tossed out once the review conference proper started. But can you give us a bit of a flavour of what are the differences between those two? Yeah, no, thanks very much. Um, like you said, the BWC, at least until the eighth review conference, was really kind of following the traditional pattern of a preparatory process. There was, like you said, and like you know, you know very well after sitting through some of them as well on the podium. Um, you know, there was a traditional two or three day preparatory committee meeting some months before the review conference itself. And like you said, that preparatory committee only really dealt with procedural issues. The model in The Hague for the OPCW was very, very different to that. There was a often a, probably an 18 month period leading up to the review conference where you would have meetings of something called an, well, an open-ended working group to prepare for the review conference. Um, and it's interesting to see why, you know, why that decision was taken to do it completely differently to the NPT or to the BWC. As I mentioned before, in The Hague you have the OPCW, you have a, a permanent organisation, 450 staff members, plus an executive council which meets on a regular basis, plus informal consultations which are going on almost every week. So there's a, almost like a constant interaction between states, between the states and the technical secretariat. So it was very much thought that you don't need to have a, a PREPCOM in the traditional sense because there's always this kind of, there's a permanent cycle of meetings going on. And then also you have other more procedural issues like the um, one of the you know um, functions of a prepcom like you said is to adopt the agenda of the review conference, whereas in the OPCW the executive council that's a function of the executive council is to adopt the agenda of the conference of states parties. So that function of a prepcom wasn't wasn't necessary. Um, there were also other reasons, uh, partly relating to finance. It was felt, this is back in 2001, when this decision was first taken to use this open-ended working group approach, that a PREPCOM would be too expensive, you know, a big one-off meeting. Um, the open-ended working group meets more regularly, more informally. There were also concerns from some of the Hague-based um, delegations that they would lose kind of control to capital-based people who may come in for the, the big set-piece meeting. There were also um, concerns from states that weren't members of the Executive Council. So 41 members, there are 41 members of the Executive Council. So some of those who weren't amongst those 41 were concerned that the process would be kind of controlled by the Executive Council. So it was the open-ended working group approach was one way to make it more inclusive and, and more open. And so you actually had you know, a very in-depth review process going on, perhaps even for, like I said, about 18 months before. Mm -hmm the review conference actually started and you had input obviously from states parties, also from the technical secretariat, the scientific advisory board, um, NGOs, you know, civil society, industry and so on as well. So it was a you know, very in-depth, very detailed review process. And presumably, as you said uh, in the introduction, that in a way that's a function of having a big operational uh, organisation that can support this kind of continuous... Um, I just want to turn back to Alison now and a couple of other areas perhaps you can compare and contrast with BWC and CWC, that's the Arms Trade Treaty and the mm -hmm. Programme of Action on Small Arms, mm -hmm. both of which you were heavily involved in. Yeah, those are good examples to bring up because they represent um, very different ways of working um, than, than I think what we're experiencing in the NPT context. Um, so the program of action on small arms and light weapons will be having its review conference this June in New York. And it recently held a one-week preparatory committee also in New York in March. Um, and that was really the only preparatory uh, convening that was held uh, to get ready for, for the review conference. Um, and it kind of functioned a bit in the way of what we've seen this week here, um, statements expressed across a variety of thematic issues. Uh, I think the chair is trying to get a sense of what should be the top priorities to address for actionable points in June. Um, but beyond that, they, they kind of have these like biennial meetings of states, uh, which conferences of states parties type uh, format. Um, so there, I feel like there's there's less preparation maybe than just sort of this one one week meeting, just a, f a few months out from from the big event itself. 
Um, and then in the Arms Trade Treaty, the, uh, the ATT, actually interestingly, it has annual conferences of states' parties uh, around August, September, depending on the year. Um, and it has so far been having, it's a newer instrument, of course, but it's been having a series of one-day prep comms, if you will, uh, to prepare for the CSPs. Uh, its first review conference will be coming up next year, but as far as I can see, there's not really any intentional thinking or planning yet around how they want to prepare for that. And I think because they've sort of got this regular interim series of meetings, there are also three working groups uh, that exist under the ATT, and they meet uh, formally three times a year and probably informally more than that. So there's sort of more intercessional activity around that instrument. Uh, and I think that will probably decrease some of the pressure on the review conference for you know, for taking really big decisions or seeing really big things happen. Um, and of course, across all of these things, there's spaces to talk about the procedural issues, what will be on the agenda, um, who will chair them, so on and so forth. Thanks, Alison. I, I, this is an interesting idea about the, uh, the one of the purposes of a preparatory process being to take the pressure off the, mm -hmm. the review conference or whatever the big event at the end of the preparatory process is. Um, and I'm wondering, how much does that actually work? And looking at what we've seen this week, or well, these past two weeks in the NPT PrepCom, has that actually done anything to make the 2020 review conference easier? Uh, in what senses are we preparing for that conference, or are we just engaging in a ritual round of yeah. uh, you know, venting and, uh, and moving on to next year? Yeah, I think that's a, <laughs> it's a good way of saying it, venting, a ritual of venting. Um, I, yeah, I don't, I don't think that it, it really gets decisions necessarily closer to being taken at the, at the review conference. I think, it, at least over these last two weeks, is a particular preparatory meeting. Um, you know, things are becoming more tense, and that's being uh, seen in a lot of different ways in the room, through rights of reply, which are very unusual in the NPT context. They've been very direct, very straightforward. Um, and I think that this meeting has probably maybe going to have an adverse effect on, on the coming review conference. But of course, that is still two years away. Uh, a lot could change between now and then. Um, and I also think that it would be um, odd maybe to pretend that these tensions and differences of opinion don't exist. You know, none of these meetings should be operating in a bubble or in a vacuum. They're meant to be having change and affect change in the real world. And so to do that, you have to take into account real political realities. Um, but I, I think that there are other ways in which you can mobilize towards leading up to a review conference and handle a preparatory process. I think things like having working groups or subsidiary bodies where they can kind of, you know, pick out one of these very many different things that a review conference has to decide on and say, let's make some focused progress on this and just delegate a few people or a few states to sort of shepherd that forward. Um, yeah, maybe I'll stop there. Yeah. But immediately what makes me want to go back to the CWC, if I can, Daniel, because if we're talking then about reducing the pressure or what are we preparing for, I mean, it, it's quite, again, as you've said, quite a different model, so how does it work? Yeah, and something that Alison said just, you know, sparked that in my mind as well was you know, it, it's very, the CWC model is very different in the fact that this open-ended working group, like I said, is meeting for many, many months before the review conference. And one thing it's doing is just the regular review. So it's calling for, you know, views, inputs from states' parties. The secretariat itself presents, you know, its experience with implementing the convention, you know, conducting inspections, for example. Um, the scientific advisory board, so there's all of these inputs coming in. But towards the end of that review process, the, the chair of the open-ended working group generally starts to kind of distill what he or she has been hearing and, and basically starts preparing a draft report. Now, it's a draft report of the open-ended working group, but the intention, and this is since the very first, the, the very first chair of the first open-ended working group was the, the perm rep of Argentina in The Hague at the time, and he was very clear in saying that, you know, two-week review conference isn't enough time to review the convention. We need to start preparing even the final document of the RevCon. We need to start preparing that before those two weeks. So in The Hague, the practice has always been, and this goes back to what you said at the beginning, sometimes with more success and sometimes with less success, 
but one of the intended outputs of the open-ended working group process has been literally a draft report for the review conference. And as I said, on two occasions, the first and the third review conferences, that's pretty much what's happened. The draft report has been um, basically accepted in some sense as um, the basis for the report of the review conference. At the second CWC review conference, that was less, less the case. It was clear that the report which the chair of the open-ended working group had produced for the second CWC review conference was not, you know, did not meet with that wide acceptance from, from delegations. And so the review conference then, back in um, 2008, really had to almost start from scratch when drafting the report. So it's, it's different, you know, this CWC process isn't just an opportunity for, for venting and for, you know, what, what you describe happening here. It's, it's much more kind of operational in a way. They're actually producing a draft, they do produce a draft report, which is often taken, well, two, two out of the three cases so far, it's been taken as the basis for the draft report at the review conference. So in lots of ways that, I suppose, does take the pressure off the review conference itself. But if... Um Coming to the BWC then, which had this originally very um, minimal um, preparatory process, but most recently has had a more expanded one, and you've, you've seen how, how, how that's worked. Can, could you just tell us what were the differences and how, how did that, you know, did it help better prepare, having a more extensive one? Sure. So I guess the BWC sits somewhere between um, what I'm describing about the Chemical Weapons Convention with the very elaborate, very institutionalized process and then the NPT with these meetings, you know, once a year in the, the three years preceding the review conference. So BWC, as many of you are familiar with, you know, we have five yearly review conferences as well. But as well as that, there's also the annual meetings as, as we have this year. In August, there'll be meetings of experts. In December, there'll be a, a meeting of states parties and that intercessional program um, has been in place for quite a long time. There was a kind of hiatus of sorts last year, but that's been um, re-established now for this year and the next two years before the ninth BWC review conference in 2021. So it's, it's a kind of hybrid in some ways. It does, you know, the BWC preparatory process does operate within a slightly institutionalized context in that there are meetings, but there isn't the big organization. There's not the the permanent interaction. This year, for example, we have a week, week and a half basically in the summer and then a, a short four-day meeting in December as well. So it's not continuous like it is at OPCW. Um, but you know, from 2015, so when preparations or discussions began to prepare for the 2016 BWC review conference, the feeling was very much that in 2011 there hadn't been enough preparation time for the seventh review conference and enough time to get into substance. So many delegations thought, and then all delegations agreed at the end of 2015, that there should be this more kind of elaborated preparatory process for the 2016 review conference. So you ended up with this kind of two-step preparatory committee meeting that took place in 2016. There was a two-day meeting, purely procedural meeting in April 2016, and then there was a one-week substantive PrepCon meeting in August in which actual, you know, substantive discussions took place, topics. I guess it was a bit more in some ways like what you're doing or what you've been doing here because there was substantive discussions. You know, there was the general debate. There were, you know, thematic discussions. And at the end, there wasn't an, a consensus report. There was a, a report with a chairman's summary attached. So I think, again, from what I understand, that's what happens or what's happening here as well. Um, so, yeah, that, that was meant to be an improvement on, you know, the previous practice within the BWC. Whether it was or not, I guess some people would say, well, you know, the success of that would be, the measure of that success would be the review conference that took place, you know, after that preparatory process that it was preparing for, which was the eighth review conference in 2016. And, you know, when many people look at that, they say, well, it wasn't really a success. So was the preparatory process actually, you know, was it worth it? Um, my feeling was that that preparatory process was, was worth it. It was very detailed. It was... Uh, you know, we had, I think, over 80 working papers submitted to the PrepCom and the review conference. There was a lot of substantive discussions. And also partly it's, you know, if you just focus on what happened in Geneva at the formal meeting, then you may think, well, yeah, not, not great and perhaps not particularly effective. But it was what it kind of catalyzed in a more informal sense through other meetings, you know, meetings that civil society was organizing, that were done on a regional or a national basis. So it did catalyze more 
more thinking, I think, in a way. So it, it did kind of move a little bit towards that OPCW approach, but not in anywhere near the kind of formalized or institutionalized way um, that the OPCW does it. So although it may, may have not looked particularly successful, I think it also helped to set, you know, set the scene for the decision that was eventually taken last year to, to re-establish the intercessional program as well. Yes, it, it's an interesting case because it's, it's a kind of transition and I want to, I'm, I'm trying to identify what are the, the, the common features in, in these different species of, of uh, preparatory processes. And it seems to me like one big difference is there's a difference between those processes or those treaties where there is something actually to do mm. in the preparatory process. And you, of course, mentioned the, the OPCW and the Chemical Weapons Convention where, you know, it's very sort of practically focused, hands-on, there's, there's chemical weapons to be destroyed, there's facilities to be inspected, there's all kinds of things that, that need to be monitored and, and reviewed. And so that's, that's quite hands-on. And then with, even with a, new treaty, with a new treaty like the Arms Trade Treaty, you have a lot of meetings where states, parties and, and uh, civil society and so on are busy trying to sort of set up the treaty and mm -hmm. uh, decide how it's going to work and, and get, get grumpy because it's not working the way they want. And, right. and, but, you know, there's, again, quite a practical focus of, the, of, of those meetings, um, whether you describe them as a formal preparatory process or not. The, the states' parties are getting together to actually do something. Whereas with the NPT, okay, there's a, there's a clear purpose to the preparatory process in that it's preparing for the, the next review conference of the NPT, but there isn't actually anything to do. If we, if we thought, for example, of um, sort of setting up working groups or, or sort of subcommittees, I mean, what would they do? Mm. Uh, have you got any thoughts on that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I do have thoughts on that. I have thoughts on a couple other things as you're, as you're talking now that just sort of came to mind. Like, it's interesting because, you know, in the NPT, we do have this sort of annual gathering that is the preparatory committee um, leading up to a review conference. And in some of the other uh, treaties that we've discussed here, you also have an annual gathering. But because it's a conference of states' parties, it's able to take decisions and sort of action items in a way that preparatory committees do not. Um, but there's still, you sort of still have this tension between like, you know, annuals and then reviews. And I was thinking a little bit about the work um, of the Ottawa Convention on Anti-Personnel Landmines and also the Convention on Cluster Munitions. Um, they, they also follow this model of having annual uh, conferences of states parties and then, and then review conferences, usually where they issue a new action plan uh, on how to progress the different objectives of those instruments. Um, and I, I, I can't help but feel that that approach seems to be bearing more fruit. Um, like ATT right now, definitely a lot of these early CSPs, the decisions that are being taken are about, you know, approving the working groups, approving their, their their TORs, approving who will lead them, and sort of this procedural stuff. And, and civil society has been critical that that's been sort of obstructing any discussion of substance or taking substantive discussions. Um, but when you look at other instruments that have that same setup, uh, but are maybe a little bit more mature, uh, you can see where there are substantive decisions and actions being made at these annual meetings, conferences of states parties, not preparatory committees, versus, well, and in addition to, to review conferences. I think I've gotten lost in my thoughts. I may have forgotten your initial question. <laughs> um. the, the initial question was, you know, what the, some of the pro, 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 preparatory processes we've talked mm. about are very much focused on you know, doing something. Yeah. And whereas the NPT, there doesn't really seem to be anything to do. And if we sort of were to, to look at fiddling with the format of the NPT prep comms and like set up working groups or subcommittees like you have in the, in the Ottawa mm -hmm. Treaty, for example, what would they be on? I mean, what, ah, okay. is, is there anything they could be doing other than arguing about what they're going to argue about in, in the review conference? Yeah. I mean, I, th I think in the NPT there's no shortage of unresolved issues and unfulfilled uh, action points uh, going back to earlier stages in the NPT's history. So, and the reason that it's difficult to make progress on them is because they're highly politicized. Um, but I think that you could, you know, you could take decisions to take action on a range of different things, whether it be uh, making more progress with respect to the Middle East. Um, there's been, you know, discussion about discouraging withdrawals from the treaty and how to respond to things like that. There's been discussions about improving the overall working methods and, and effective use of time in conference settings. So I think 
between these sort of like substantive things as well as procedural issues, you could task a body uh, to, to take up any of these things. I don't, I don't know why that's not happening. I mean, I, I have some, <laughs> I have some, some ideas, um, but I, I think that there's, there's lots of different stuff that NPT um, could, could choose to do. And I think that one of what I see is one of the things that really um, like uh, holds back NPT a lot is that when you know when you take decisions, it always seems to be in this sort of packaged format. Um, and if you could just sort of separate a few things out or pick a few things where you really want to make progress on and, and separate it out a little bit from the other issues that are maybe harder, more intractable, um, then you might be able to progress in small ways on a couple things instead of trying to do everything all at once, all the time, if that makes sense. I think it does make sense, though very quickly you tend to get into this, uh, this kind of argument, so we don't want to make progress on your issue because we're yeah. not getting any progress on our issue uh, and hostage taking and so on. Um, but still, you'd think there'd be some scope to, to do some more and um, well, perhaps at this point we can, we can bring in the audience and uh, get some other points of view. The floor is, is open. If you'd like to, to join the discussion, just raise your hand and press the button on your, your machine. What can we do with the NPT prep comms? <laughs> You're far away, yes. Thank you, Richard, for such an interesting uh, side event. And <clears throat> my question is to Alison regarding the uh, prep comms. Uh, last year we had first prepcom and now we have the second and uh, both of them ended up with the chair summary mm -hmm. and do you think it is uh, a useful and supportive instrument for the uh, review conference in 2020 and others in future uh, maybe it would be more useful uh, to <clears throat> to have a rule uh, only of two options, uh, consensus recommendations or nothing. Mm -hmm. Then instead of we having this uh, chair summary, which are last year and this year, which are obviously pulling off to the non-proliferation non issues and less and less on disarmament. And we see that uh, some countries are more and more disappointed. So, and uh, yeah, my question is, uh, are these chairs somewhere useful or they bring more attention on, on the future review uh, conference? Thank you. Hmm, good question. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I think they're, they're probably easier to do than trying to go a different route and agreeing other types of documents or outcomes, and that's probably why that's what it happens. Um, I think they, they can be useful because they are meant to anyway, provide sort of a factual overview of what was discussed, um, give an indication of levels of support for different views. Uh, but the problem is that that's not always happening. And I think that, you know, especially coming after the last three hours this morning, um, we've heard quite a lot of NPT states parties expressing that they're very disappointed uh, with the current chair's factual summary. Uh, they don't see it as factual, or even if what is contained in it represents what was said, um, the way in which the weighting that's been given to different perspectives doesn't reflect the actual weighting that has existed in the room. So I think, yes, if, if they are a neutral reflection, they can be helpful, a helpful record of the meeting, maybe without having to go through exhaustively statement after statement. Um, but if they're going to become politicized themselves, then, then they're not really serving the purpose that they're meant to. Thanks, Alison. Yes, it's, it's a good question, and um, there's a fellow, uh, maybe you've come across this already, but there's a, a, an American fellow called Bob Einhorn, uh, who's a former State Department person now, an academic, uh, who's been writing um, and quite often coming to Geneva to speak about uh, his ideas that you should get away from trying to have a consensus document um, in the NPT. Uh, and which I found quite interesting. And his idea was that you just adopt a document that listed all the proposals and things that people, different countries wanted. Mm. And possibly including 
uh, some indication of the level, respective level of support for each each proposal. But maybe that's not even necessary. I mean, you could just list the proposals and say these things were suggested and did not did not uh, reach consensus. But nevertheless, are recorded here in the report for anyone who wants to to make use of them. And his idea then is that countries that wanted to do these things um, would would go ahead and do them, and those that didn't wouldn't. Um, which is an interesting idea for various reasons, but one thing that reminded me of, and um, perhaps we'll come back to Daniel, is, is in, that's actually very much the way that, um, well, at least used to, maybe you've changed now, um, the Biological Weapons Convention re reports of the meeting of states parties are done in that it is a consensus document, but along with that is another document which is a sort of, it's it still called the synthesis chairs, yeah, synthesis yeah. paper, is not adopted by consensus, but it contains a list of measures of proposals and things that states parties should or could do. Um, and for most countries, uh, in my experience, that that's the valuable part of the report, because that's what they take home and say, oh, this is, this is what we can do, we need to do this. Um, and even though it's not ever adopted by consensus, it still carries the weight of kind of the approval of the, of the treaty. Um, but maybe Daniel mm -hmm. to speak a bit more about that. I think, I mean, it's an interesting question and it's, you know, it, it relates back to this issue of what's, you know, what's success and what's failure because often success of one of these kinds of, meet, you know, the review conferences itself, when you look at the historical record, they say, you know, conference X failed because it didn't adopt a final report or, you know, conference, you know, Y succeeded because it did adopt a final report. Now, when you look in more detail, it may be that conference X, it didn't adopt a final report, but it did a very thorough review of the convention, which is the function of the review conference. And it may be that Conference Y adopted a report, but it, it didn't really review the convention. You know, it was just a very high level report. So, you know, given what their function is, I think it's good to not only focus on, you know, did they adopt a report, yes or no. It's good to look at, you know, I mean, the, I'm going to go back to fifth BWC review conference. I mean, it ended with no final report. The conference was adjourned, came back the final year. But the following year, but you know, during the time of that conference, there was a lot of discussion on issues of substance, and the convention was largely, you know, in, in various aspects, the convention was reviewed as such. So it's, you know, it, it's partly relating relating to that. I think what is the definition of success and what's the definition of failure? I mean, the issue of chairman summaries. I, I don't know. We don't. We had that in the prepcom for the eighth review conference in 2016, and it. It went fairly well. It was, again, it was just completely on the chair's responsibility, his own prerogative, his own view of, you know, the, the balances of views and proposals and everything. So it, it wasn't intended and it wasn't used as a basis for the report for the review conference in comparison to what I described in, in The Hague. Um, and like Richard said, it, with the BWC, with the meetings of experts in particular in the past, they've always had this very voluminous annex and kind of table which goes on for pages, pages and pages of every, trying almost every proposal, every suggestion made. Um, the document has a title, I can't even remember the title of the annex, it's like, you know, compilation of recommendations, conclusions, proposal, you know, it, it tries to encompass everything that was said during the, the meeting of experts. And as Richard said, it's not adopted by consensus, it's, a, it's an annex to, to the report, just intended almost as a reference. Which I think, you know, certainly has a use, but again, it's a, it's a more technical thing than, than what's happening here at the moment with the adoption of a, you know, more political chair and summary. And I, I think there is a point to what you were both saying earlier about, you know, a meeting that has something to do. You know, if it, if it, if it doesn't really have anything to do other than just to discuss the issues, then, then it's, it, it's always, I guess, quite likely that it will sort of flounder in a way that it won't have a... You know, that it will just be seen as an opportunity to talk about anything and to bring any, any other issues. Yeah. And as Alison said at the beginning, I mean, obviously none of these meetings happens in a vacuum. Other issues are always going to come in. But if there is a purpose and if there are, you know, specific topics or even decisions to be done, to be taken, then I guess that gives a bit more focus. Whereas something, something that's not that just does run the risk of just being more of a an opportunity to talk and not really to advance anything, perhaps even the opposite, to undo, undo things that have happened in the past. <laughs>
flounder, that's the word I've been looking for. <laughs> but Alison, you had something to add to that. Um, yeah, I just, I think it's, it's also good to remember that, I think, when you said, like, what is success or what is failure, like, it's, um, it's, it's kind of a strange environment in which we work in, in which success means, you know, we've agreed a document. Like, all of these instruments that we've talked about today are meant to save lives, make lives better, make the world safer. Um, and I think that when we spend a lot of time in these meetings, we just start, really start to define things in very strange ways that have no reflection on the real world impact that we want to be having. Um, you know, I, in, in my current job, you know, I spend a lot of time monitoring and listening to conferences. I've also done this in previous jobs, but I think what's a really nice uh, part of being in civil society networks is that you're always in touch with people on the ground who are always questioning this, like, okay, states met and they had a meeting about, you know, whatever weapons issue, um, but how is that going to help me? How is it going to help my country? How is it going to make things better? And I think that there's just such a, a disconnect between what's happening up here and what's happening on the ground, and there somehow needs to be a better reminder of that, and, and less of defining success and, oh, we agreed on a piece of paper. And I, I know that that's part of, part of the scene and part of the environment, but it's increasingly there's disconnect. Uh, no, thanks, Alison. I think that's... That's very much the case, and um, uh, it comes back to the, the idea of you know, meetings that have something to do and meetings that don't. Mm. Because, I mean, some of the, the Biological Weapons Convention stuff is, is really obscure and abstract, but nevertheless, they do come out with a document that contains mm -hmm. stuff which, if national governments implement, mm -hmm. will make the world safer. So you can, you know, sometimes a little bit distant, but you can make the, mm -hmm. the connection. Whereas, whereas the NPT this week, for example, I can't... It's very hard for me to find some way of saying how's how's this actually contributing anything except foreshadowing some further discussions mm. that are going to take place in a couple of years. But maybe that's just me. Anyway, thank you for the for the question. It's triggered some <laughs> quite a few thoughts. Uh, any others or thoughts? Yeah, go ahead. Thank you, Daniel, Richard, Ellison, for this uh, interesting theme. Uh, the question is, um, how do you think? Um, are there any interconnections between, um, uh, since we are, uh, we, you are <laughs> talked about BWCC, Chemical Weapon Convention, NPT preparatory um, process, are there any interconnections between the having a permanent secretariat or organization or RCU or some, you know, the support for NPT uh, between this and the uh, good or success or failure of the Preparatory process and uh, review conferences, because as Daniel said that in OPCW, it is well established uh, mechanism uh, with uh, several bodies which could help for preparing of all this process for for BWC and, and uh, CCW we have ICUs, ICU one now <laughs> only. Uh, and um, for NPT, it is uh, not 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 so uh, highlighted uh, support. I mean, uh, very good support for UNDA, but it is not a special uh, organ. Let's say, is it any interconnections? Thank you. Yes, that's right. I mean, perhaps we can have a quick overview. Perhaps looking at ATT and program of action, and then. Uh, See, we've perhaps already spoken about, but let's start with the yeah. um, You know, and maybe just sort of like an overarching uh, comment is that I, I think having some sort of permanent entity that helps make treaties work is, is usually useful and good. Um, the Arms Trade Treaty, because it, it is a new instrument, it's ISU uh, Secretariat, uh, it's here in Geneva. It's only been established, I think, for two years, maybe three. Um, so I think it's sort of still getting its feet underneath itself and, you know, making things happen, but I think it's, it can then facilitate the sort of intercessional meetings of working groups, of these preparatory one-day meetings for the eventual conferences of states parties, and that's very helpful. Um, maybe another example is the Convention on Certain Conventional Weapons, CCW, which facilitates work across really a very broad cross-section of issues, 
um, and because of, of different things that have happened with its ISU and a reduction of support, uh, it's, there was a tangible impact last year. Some of the meetings on autonomous weapons weren't able to take place um, as planned, or they may or may be less serviced as they would have otherwise been. Um, and that's, I don't, I'm not trying to criticize anything, but just to sort of highlight, you know, what can be there and what is maybe not there, uh, depending on the, the, the availability or existence of a, an entity to help make a treaty work. Um, yeah, thanks, for, thanks, Arsene. Thanks for a good question. Um, I don't think that there's a direct connection, I guess, between, you know, a permanent institution and success because you have some examples of, you know, success when you don't have that. I mean, there are NPT review conferences, mm. you know, when you've had a, you know, success in terms of a final, an agreed final do document. There, as I said, even with the big OPCW, you know, institution, the permanent institution, while there hasn't been a, a failure in the sense of a non-adoption of a document, you know, there has, as I mentioned, there was difficulty with the preparatory process, you know, kind of segging into the second review conference in 2008. Um, so it doesn't, you know, having a big institution like that doesn't necessarily determine success. There, you know, there's probably not a direct link between that. Um, but I'm sure, it, I'm sure it does help because, you know, from what I know from OPCW, from what I experienced during my time there, you know, the Secretariat itself, during that 18-month process, has the time to kind of reflect. You know, the Secretariat is requested to produce an overview document reviewing five years of implementation. The Scientific Advisory Board does something similar for issues of science and technology. So there's a lot of internal reflection going on, um, which is all submitted, you know, to the meetings, to the OEWG and then to the REVCON. States parties themselves do their own internal thinking. Civil society does its thinking, you know, about the particularly on future issues as well. So I, I think, you know, having that big permanent institution is obviously a, is a benefit, but I don't think it guarantees um, success. And one thing that having that um, permanent institution in The Hague in some ways may actually decrease the um, kind of likelihood that the review conference itself will be a kind of strategic opportunity. And that's something we saw is that the review conferences of CWC were often seen by many participants as really the same as the regular, the annual conference of states parties, just without the budget negotiations. That's, you know, it was just the same, people felt they were going through the same motions. So because you have a permanent kind of cycle of meetings, it's kind of harder to lift people's attention to the kind of strategic, you know, backwards or forwards looking level, because they're always down in the weeds almost every week or every month, you know, planning inspections, evaluating declarations, you know, negotiating the following year's budget or something. So having a permanent institution can sometimes mean that you kind of focus too much on the, the operational short-term stuff and you don't focus enough on the more strategic stuff, which can happen by only having a, a more limited machinery and more limited opportunities because then it's very clear that this this particular meeting is the opportunity, this five-year period, to think about the future. Just, um, sorry again, I think like as we talk more about it, things occur to me. And I, <laughs> I remember um, in the in the run-up to establishing the ATT Secretariat, there was a lot of talk about, you know, what, what should its mandate be? And some were of the view that it should be largely administrative, manage the budgets, organize the meetings of states' parties, these kinds of things. Um, others felt that no, it would be important that it have some policy capacity, that it can support states' parties in implementing the treaty, that it have more of a dual function. Uh, there is also discussion about, you know, the reports that states' parties have to submit, uh, that it could be the repository for those, it could conduct some evaluation, it could send reminders to states' parties maybe when they were had forgotten to do so, these kinds of things. So maybe rethinking a bit about what I, I said initially is that I guess, you know, the impact of any kind of entity, ISU, Secretariat, um, is probably, you know, related to its overall mandate and, and size and what it can bring to something. Thanks. Uh, Asad, can I throw this, your question back at you? Because um, I was very interested in the, this idea of, you know, the different structures behind or the different institutional support behind different processes. And as you mentioned, the NPT really is the is the odd one out in all these treaties, and it has no, no secretariat of its own. Um, and I, I think all the others have at least something. Uh, perhaps CCW now is also a bit orphaned, but 
Um, but as a national delegate, as Kazakhstan, um, how do you see that when you look at the NPT and the NPT meetings? What differences do you see? I mean, do you see a need for more support, institutional support? Or do you see the NPT process handicapped or harmed in some way because of the absence of that? What's, what's the view from a, from a national delegate? We won't, we won't tell your government. But. <laughs> Uh, I could speak uh, from from my own. <laughs> uh, I, I'm myself a delegation of Arsena. <laughs> um, I think yes, maybe we, we have to have some uh, secretariat or something like this because uh, this uh, really oldest treaty. So uh, maybe it could be difficult to establish the secretariat because of. We have IAEA, for instance, uh, CDPTO, and uh, uh, the, the organizations with part of mandate, let's say, of NPT already there. And it is maybe some tricky to, to establish the common like umbrella secretariat for, for this. But um, I think uh, that, yes, we, we, we have to have some uh, secretariat for institutional memory, for uh, for of people to whom we could address some direct, uh, direct questions or something like this, yes. Any other thoughts on that? Anyone want to talk about the NPT Secretariat? Or, or other questions, comments? Yes, please. Thank you. Um, I'm now speaking on behalf of my government, <laughs> even though I came from China. <laughs> um, two comments and one question. Comment one, um, the current um, format of the NPT preparatory um, process, I prefer to take it as an annual uh, meetings of the state parties rather than uh, a preparatory committee as three sessions. Years. Um, you see uh, people and the delegations are uh, talking about all the related issues in the preparatory uh, session, but um, um, that, that's all. And um, after the factual summary from the chair, and that's all. The connectivity, the connection between the preparatory uh, commission to the review conference may be is a ideal enough. Uh, comment two uh, is about the, um, the, 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 the international context um, is changing fast. And nowadays people, some delegations are talking about the PRK issue under the uh, NPT prepared uh, committee. But we don't know after two years when we have the 2020 review conference, maybe that, that will be a totally different scenario over the peninsula. So what such discussion, such pressure on the PRK, such a, how to say, um, emphasis on the sanction side of the, the issue will help the MPT uh, uh, review conference. Maybe two years later, the PRK already returned to us. <laughs> then the question, um, I would like to uh, invite your attention to um, uh, the, the distinction between the failure and the success of a uh, BT review conference uh, to the uh, important, uh, unimportant element that will be the political will of state parties. Um, if we would like to improve the uh, preparatory process and the uh, methodology uh, of such a preparatory process, we need to develop or uh, reflect deeply on how to attract and gather political wills. Maybe the organizational issues could help a little, a little bit, but I doubt. Um, uh, so I want to ask the panelists, the two <laughs> dear panelists, what do you, could you suggest or recommend to, uh, uh, to, to gather um, political will? especially at this. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>
Uh, an easy question. An easy yeah. question. So no. Um, but just just so I understand, so it's, it's more about the question is more about um, how to better harness political will to make the preparatory committees more effective. Or exactly. Exactly. Okay. Um, well, I feel like that is the million dollar question that everybody would like to have the answer to, particularly those of us in civil society. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't, maybe like one, one approach sort of is to, um, is to unpack, uh, some of the issues a little bit. Um, like, it, as you said, like when we come to these meetings and you talk about such a broad spectrum of things, you know, across all three pillars, it becomes a sort of like dizzying whirl of topics and problems. And I think it almost makes you a little bit numb and it makes you tune out a little bit. Um, so maybe a format that identifies, you know, a few priorities, and maybe even that's too hard to get to and it's not easy to agree, but maybe having a bit of a sharper focus um, could, could help really like focus minds and focus energy and then action and hopefully political will. Um, rather than just sort of having this like very large menu of problems to solve, which it's it's very daunting, right? Um, and then I don't I don't know how well this would work in the NPT context, but certainly it has worked in other contexts. Is you know having more interaction with people who have been impacted by the weapon in question. Um, certainly in talking about small arms and light weapons and other conventional weapons, inviting uh, survivors who have maybe been physically injured. Uh, or have had their communities injured or impacted, um, things like this, it sort of brings home and reinforces the message and the problem. And sometimes that can really be a game changer in uh, encouraging political will and action. Again, I, I, don't, I don't know how well that would work in the NPT context. It was the impetus for the humanitarian initiative, which has now led us to the TPNW. Uh, and of course, that's very uh, politically sensitive, the NPT. But that's, those might be just two recommendations at the top of my head. Um, I don't, I mean, you were more talking about the NPT itself, and I don't really, I don't know that much and I've never worked on the MPT itself so but I mean obviously the, the bigger issue of political will is, fresh perspective. Yeah. <laughs> the bigger issue of political will I guess is, is something that's that's really crucial uh, partly going back to a, the previous question as well um, was about making the the link between what happens in these kinds of meetings and what happens in the in the real world a bit like Alison was just talking about and a bit like a, one of the previous questions as well is you know how to make these these meetings seem more relevant to people, to the international community, even to, to states sometimes as well, you know, particularly from the BWC point of view. It's often quite hard to, you know, to get participation in the meetings, to get people to come to the meetings, even from, you know, states that have delegations here in Geneva. We often have some states, we know they have delegations here in Geneva, but they don't come to the BWC meetings, so it's not seen as relevant for them. So, you know, before you can even get political will for states to support a particular meeting or an outcome from a meeting, you need to get their interest and to get them involved and you know participating in the meeting as well. And I think one way that we tried, you know, during 2016, um, looking at China, also looking at Kazakhstan as well, we had meetings, you know, workshops, regional workshops or international workshops. Kazakhstan hosted a regional workshop for Central Asia and Eastern Europe. China, you remember, hosted an international workshop in Wuxi. In prep, so both in preparation for the review conference. So I think that's one way in which to kind of increase the relevance, perhaps increase the kind of political salience, um, and you know perhaps in, in combination increase the political will for a meeting as well is by getting outside of the regular meeting places, outside of Geneva or Vienna or New York, you know, getting into the regions. You, you get closer in that way to you know the people or the communities, and, and like I said, not not just you know, victims or victim communities, but just actual states who don't, at the moment, understand or the relevance of, in, you know, in the case that I'm most familiar with now, the Biological Weapons Convention, you know, they, they don't understand that relevance to them. Um, and all of that made me, and I was wondering this just now, when Alison was speaking, that the biggest, well, not the biggest, but one of the big differences between the two processes that I'm most familiar with, CWC and BWC, and the NPT, is that the MPT process moves around the world. I mean, you're here for this meeting in Geneva, but last year it was Vienna, it's gonna be New York, you know, so you at least go to different places 
whereas OPCW meetings always happen in The Hague. BWC meetings always happen in Geneva. So it's a question, I don't know, either Alison or Richard or for any of you as well, does that, um, does that help the NPT process moving around like that? Does it, does it hinder the process? Um, I guess you're, you're not going to regions, you're going to other UN yes. meeting centers, so perhaps it doesn't make any difference. You're still kind of in the UN, mm -hmm. whether it's New York, Geneva or Vienna. I, I don't know, but I just wonder if that moving around is a, is a help, is a hindrance? I, I, I don't know, I'd, I'd be interested. Maybe you want to talk about this, Alison, but uh, it imme immediately made me think of the um, Landline Bank yeah. Convention yeah. and the Cluster Mission Convention, which, which do move around to uh, every second annual meeting is held in a, in a victim, in a mine affected or cluster bomb affected country. And that certainly does help to bring it um, closer to reality, but also costs a lot more. So <laughs> there's some trade offs there. Um, just before I hand back to you, Alison, I I'm very interested in, in, in your question about how to um, how to gather this political will uh, in the NPT, um, and I wonder if one path to think about exploring is making the preparatory prepcons more like, as you say, more like annual meetings, and giving them the power to actually take some action, because then you can. You can get the political will because um, member states will come because they think that they might be able to actually do something. Mm -hmm. And your example of, of North Korea is, you know, is a very good one. What's the point of talking about it now when you're not going to be able to take any action until 2020 when the situation could and we hope will be completely different? Mm -hmm. um, whereas if this PrepCom this last two weeks was in fact a working group on, on you know, certain aspects of the NPT, you could, you could take action now, and the action might be, or oh, we welcome the developments and the announcement by the North Korean government and, and so on. But, uh, and we, you know, we'll monitor the situation. We don't necessarily believe everything we hear, but uh, it's still a positive development. Um, and then that can be adjusted next year as, as needed. And it might also, I wonder, help to tone down the rhetoric. Because if you come to a PrepCom where you know no action is going to be taken, you can talk as strongly as you like. You can condemn North Korea and say how they're you know, absolutely terrible and, and knowing that nobody's actually going to do anything. Uh, whereas if, if there is a possibility of doing something, you need to temper your, your rhetoric a little bit because you want to try and engineer a, an agreement, a solution. So, I mean, that's, that's one idea. But, uh, Alison, did you want to... I can't yeah, remember what I was going to get Yeah, um. <laughs> moving around, yes. Moving around, yeah, well, just maybe a quick response. I was also thinking of those conventions because they, they do move their annual conferences of states parties uh, to different regions, or every two years they move in and out of capital. Um, and I think it's had a great um, a great impact. I think it's it's helped to demonstrate the relevance of those instruments to different national or regional contexts. It's helped build more ownership in those conventions uh, because the hosting country then feels, you know, a certain sense of pride and wanting to have a good meeting. Um, how they how they how they portray it, see a success. Um, when the AT, when discussions about the ATT Secretariat uh, were happening, there were um, three three locations: Vienna, Geneva, and um, and Port of Spain in Trinidad and Tobago. There were the three candidate cities to host the Secretariat. And a lot of the arguments in favor of Port of Spain, which is, of course, much further away from everything else, is that it would send a very strong signal um, to have it located in the Global South. It would sort of get everybody out of these UN nerve centers and maybe being able to talk and interact in ways which is, you sometimes feel very constrained here, um, and also possibly distracted by all the other meetings that are going on. Um, sometimes, though, there are, if you just return to a New York versus Geneva dynamic, there are sometimes funny dynamics. I think when the NPT shifts from one city to the other, you, um, well, I guess, I guess you might have the same grouping of diplomats who are following the issues, but I think approaches are different in each city is what I've observed, and sometimes you get different dynamics in the conference room in New York than you might have here or even last year uh, in Vienna, too. Yeah, we should do we should do experiments. Uh, should. I'm personally I'm looking forward to the regional NPT workshop in Pyongyang next year. Um, any uh, we need to wrap up soon, but any perhaps have time for one or two more questions, thoughts? Yeah. 
I can wrap up April soon. <laughs> Jonathan. <laughs> Thank you for the chance to ask a question. It, it's striking me that um, the fate of the PrepComs is probably set by the quality of the treaty. And in, in certain respects, especially Article 6, NPT is sort of unimplementable. And so you can have PrepComs until the cows come home, and uh, they're not going to be very satisfactory. Because even when, it's, when the RevCon has come up with something historic, it ends up being a successful conference, but it doesn't end up being a successful disarmament instrument or, or moment or process. And it's fascinating how often success in the NPT is defined by a successful conference. It's not defined by the fruits of that conference in the real world. That happens bilaterally or multilaterally or in some other, uh, other logic. So, um, to have a better prep com, you might need a different tree than the NPT. But they certainly do not qualify as uh, exercises that very many people would be able to um, profit from if this was a business or a school or a, uh, any other institution. It's a uniquely um, talented and hardworking but not productive enterprise. Is that a question? Uh, <laughs> so, I, yeah, here's the question. So, could we analyze all treaties by the, their implementability and then see if they do better at PrepCons and, and RevCons than um, the NPT does? It might be a nice neutral way to raise some important questions. Um, thanks for the question. Yeah, it's a thought-provoking question. I mean, I'm just thinking now about the BWC. I mean, it's not a very detailed treaty. It's a very short four-page treaty. Um, you know, very general as compared with the CWC that I was talking about before, which is like 200 pages of excruciating detail. You know, everything is spelled out in the Chemical Weapons Convention. Um, so you may say that the BWC is, is also, you know, not implementable or it's, you know, it, it's not a high quality treaty. But then, you know, over the years, the review conferences have developed, they have evolved the, um, and, you know, they've taken forward the implementation of the convention. It goes back to one of the things I said at the beginning about the functions of a review conferences for the, you know, to oversee the evolution or the, the kind of elaboration of the treaty regime. And that, that's what the BWC um, review process has done of which the preparatory committees are a part. You know, they've added on a system of confidence building measures. They've added on, you know, various other understandings, you know, consultation processes, you know, things like that have been added on by the review conferences. So I, I don't know if it's down so much to the, you know, the quality of the treaty itself, as you put it. It's more, again, perhaps it goes back to, to the earlier comment about political will. It's about what states' parties can agree to do within that context, because within the context of a particular treaty, if you can get agreement, at least with the BWC, I mean, if you can get agreement, and Richard, you'll be, you know, you had a lot of experience of this, if you can get agreement on something at the, you know, the BWC review conference, then you can kind of change or shift the paradigm, the whole intercessional program, the creation of the implementation support unit, all of those things were by decision of review conference. The establishment in the 1990s of the ad hoc group, you know, came from decisions from a review conference and a special conference. So, I, I'm, yeah, I think, you know, if the political will was there within the NPT, I suppose there could also be decisions from review conferences to do things differently. So I'm not sure that there's a completely clear, clear connection to the treaty itself. It's more about what the review conferences can do and what the states' parties to that con convention can bear, you know, and can agree to do. Yeah, thanks. Uh, that's a question here. Okay, I'll just uh, quickly answer this. Um, yeah, I, I tend to say it a similar way to, to Daniel, and that is it's really the review conferences and the preparatory processes and the annual meetings and the, the sort of the community of the states' parties writ large. It's, it's not that the treaty defines, the quality of the treaty defines that. It's, I think, the other way around, that um, the 
the states' parties can do a lot to remedy the shortcomings that are written into a, a treaty. And Daniel is right about the BWC, and he mentioned some some examples, but one very good example there is, you know, the, the BWC doesn't actually, for obscure and rather silly historical reasons, the BWC doesn't actually prohibit the use of biological weapons. Um, and this is this is, you know, got um, international lawyers and academics tying themselves in knots for, for decades. But it was quite simply fixed by a review conference agreeing, you know, by consensus that the BWC prohibits use. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Full stop. They, they left out the bit in brackets and said, you moron. And, mm -hmm. and um, so, you know, that, that was really uh, potentially quite a major shortcoming in the treaty it was just fixed at a stroke by by the states' parties having the political will and deciding to fix it. And I think, in theory, Article 6 of the NPT could be the same. If you had uh, the necessary political will, it would not be unimplementable. It would be changed so it wasn't implementable. And I don't mean changed by changing the text. It would be you know, a two-finger response. <laughs> Go ahead. Could I just say, on that very point, um, maybe a clause which said when the circumstances that require this treaty have changed significantly enough, and then finish the sentence in some nice lawyerly way, the treaty uh, will need to be updated. And I'm saying that because the, the bargain at the heart of it made eminent good sense in the darkest days of the Cold War, and it saved us from, how many nuclear weapons are gone? 65,000 are gone or 55,000 are gone. So it saved us from 55,000 nuclear weapons, if you like. Um, but those circumstances don't obtain anymore. It doesn't work in a multipolar world, and it doesn't work um, where the people who got the special status are assuming they can keep that in, in per perpetuity. The apartheid features and the Cold War features. So. You'd have to have a clause which said, if, if the world's changed a lot from when this was agreed, it's not permanent. It needs to be uh, revised. And that would take it out of political will a little bit and put it on the table. Well, fortunately, as you, you alluded to, um, we need a better treaty, and we we do have one we prepared earlier. So, Over here, there's a question. Hi there. I, I think it's more thoughts than a question. Um, Lawrence Foster from the Quaker United Nations office. This is my first NPT prep con, and probably not my last. Um, I guess one of the two striking things for me, one, yes, the world has changed. Um, and I think for me that's striking, knowing, having come from the world out there, and this being my first um, NPT prep con, how some of the texts that are in, in the original treaty allude to a context that no longer exists. Uh, one example, I asked various people what the Middle East was. Nobody could answer. And I've asked several people, but the Middle East has shifted. I'm not saying we should review, unpick. I, I'm not going that. I'm not going that direction. Just something that's worth reflecting on is how the world has changed and how it's starting to seep into the walls. I think it's it's a good thing. Yes, how pragmatically applicable then are some of the things we're talking about here? If it's just a prep com to a review that happens in two years. So yes, North Korea might not be the same North Korean to you, so what, why I discuss it here, but I think it's important to keep that element of reality because that is the world we live in, and I think if we live in, we work in a va vacuum, then that, you know, it ends up being nice words on a piece of paper. So those politics, I think, need to transpire. Now, do they need to really influence the texts themselves? Yes and no. I think the world changes, and so perhaps the check texts also need to shift slightly. Another thing that struck me was the quality of engagement. Um, and I've been to quite a few high-level events, a few um, review conferences of different sorts. Um, and I, I, I don't see where that interaction happens. If we're supposed to be sharing and evolving together, I know it's the UN and I know, but yeah, I, so it might be the sort of rosy glasses on, but you know, the idea of interactive dialogues, the idea of more spaces for actual engagement between between civil society and state parties. I know that there are those side events and I know that a lot of things happen in the corridors that, you know, it's bilaterally. But I think so 
some of the issues aren't being articulated in spaces where they should be. One of the examples is the side event that we put on with the South African mission, which was very interesting for some of the things that were suddenly put into the space and were quite uncomfortable. But that was, for, for me, very telling that those things aren't necessarily being discussed in a broader space that need to be. Sort of, what are the different options out there? What are the differences in opinion within civil society of how to get there within nuclear weapon states, as well as those who are now pro-ban. So I think the, the, the quality of engagement for me would be an interesting one to revise, and that might be in the procedures of how the PrepCom is actually set up, um, which is, again, unpicking a can of worms that might not want to be unpicked, um, or the quality of engagement of civil society, where they get to speak, and how they get to speak. There, that's my two cents. No, th thanks, Florence. I, I, before I hand over to Alison, I'm sure has views on this. Um, your, your question about interaction, well, your comment about interaction, um, it, it's one that comes up quite a lot, and there's already been some discussion in the past two weeks about how to improve that. And, and it, several years ago, I remember a similar, a similar attempt to make these MPT meetings more interactive. But it just reminds me of a, a story here from the UN where, um, I forget who it was, but there was a, a young intern working at Unidir and it was during a, the PrepCom here in Geneva, and this uh, uh, intern went down to sit and listen to the, the general debate. And after a while, someone from Unity uh, came down and sat beside her and said, oh, so, you know, how, how are you enjoying it? What do you think? She said, oh, it's, it's okay, but when does the debate start? <laughs> <laughs> and um, <laughs> the process says it all, really. So how do you do that? Alison, any thoughts? And then we'll have to wrap up, I think. Um, interaction, interaction. Yeah, I'm, I don't know, I, I kind of feel like plenary sessions, like big plenary rooms are, are challenging for interactive discussion. I, I kind of don't know if I want to advocate for smaller side meetings, um, usually because for civil society that tends to result in reduced access. Um, but uh, yeah, I think, I was actually, we were just exchanging before this event began that uh, earlier in, in April, the CCW had its experts meeting on autonomous weapons. And the chair of that meeting, he was very determined that there was going to be interactive discussion throughout. Um, so he did various things by introducing diagrams uh, and then calling on states uh, to, to respond to that or asking them direct questions about interventions they had delivered earlier. Um, and it, in some cases, uh, some, some states were, you know, kind of played along and tried to be amenable to it. I think they're also limited in what they want to, what they're able to say uh, based on what's been agreed for the purposes of a statement versus uh, maybe personal opinion or expertise. Um, but, it, you know, I think there's different sort of ways of working that could be tried. I just don't know if maybe the NPT has operated this way for so many years that it's just, there's resistance really to, to shaking it up. Um, NGO access, yeah, I, that also uh, operates differently in different fora. Here we have sort of a, a one set session where we can deliver statements. Um, and then beyond that, it's sort of what we want to do through our lobby advocacy meetings, um, the sort of publications that my organization does, things like that. But another other fora, it's different. Like again, to go back to the autonomous weapons meeting, uh, civil society can intervene whenever we want to put our flag up and do so. And you don't have to be under one banner or coalition. You can be, you know, a university or a human rights watch or whomever. Uh, and there's there was a big push recently uh, in the first committee, uh, in, it takes place in October, to sort of um, move up civil society interventions instead of being at the very end of, of first committee, but sort of when you go from general debate into the thematics. And the rationale was that we wanted to be able to make our interventions relevant to what we had heard. Um, because if you're kind of just given this one bit of time and then the conversation does move a bit or new things come up, you can't be responsive. Um, and then I think that that devalues what we're able to contribute. Daniel, any final thoughts before we yeah. conclude? Um, just a couple of things sparked by that last, um, last round of questions, really. I mean, one thing is about the, the location, the, not the city or anything like that, but the actual room. Because I think here, I mean, you're using the assembly hall for the MPT PrepCon, which is probably the most intimidating and kind of, you know, un, uh, 
interactive room in this entire building because you know the people sitting on the podium must feel like they're miles mm. away from the people in the you know on the floor we have that problem in the room that we always get lumbered with room 18 which is the most obsolete old-fashioned room but again it's it's very <laughs> formal <laughs> it, it's, <laughs> um, so you know I think that already dictates the way the interaction is going to go in some ways if you have the podium like we have here and we have you sitting down there it's very much you know that kind of one way kind of unidirectional um, interaction already so I mean there would be ways to use different rooms different setups within different rooms and then you know like you said already you know involving panels of experts in the BWC context with this idea of guests of the meeting who are kind of invited experts they can be from civil society from universities that kind of thing you know so there, there are ways to do this this kind of thing it depends partly on the formality of the meeting if it's a big set piece prep com there's probably the kind of model that you have to stick to if it's a GGE like the one on laws it's you know a bit more flexible our meetings of experts this year for BWC again I think some of the chairs will be interested in again increasing the opportunities for interaction and then yeah the same same really goes for civil society as well meaning trying to increase the opportunities from the just the set piece statements or the lunchtime side events um, I remember when I was in that position working for an academic NGO for many, many years. I mean, we, we did the set piece statement, but it's not, again, it's part of this issue of success, failure, what, what to focus on. You know, doing the set piece statement is, is good, but it's not the thing that you should really focus that much on. It's more about what you're doing in the corridors and over coffee and all of those kinds of, you know, what other opportunities do you have as well. So, I mean, I... We focus less on you know our access and the, the the one hour slot to speak to the big plenary meeting, and more on you know just physical access and being around and being able to talk to people, or even before you know lobbying people in capitals and stuff. Um, but yeah, that's I know we need to finish. So. Okay, well um, it's just about quarter two, so I'd like to bring proceedings to a close. Thank you um, to both our panelists for. Thank you. for coming and sharing your, your thoughts and wisdom. Thank you to the audience who bravely come up here uh, this afternoon. I hope you found it interesting. Thank you for your, your questions and comments, which we certainly found interesting. Um, that kind of concludes this series of working methods, working methods in disarmament diplomacy. I don't know quite what we're going to do next as the, as the disarmament platform. Uh, we may sort of digest what we've concluded from these three events and perhaps launch another uh, series to perhaps work on one or two of them in a bit more detail. Leave us in August, okay. Um, so we'll stop there um, and I wish you all a, a fine conclusion to the NPT PrepCon. I think there are eight statements remaining. <laughs> Count them down. And, um, and a nice weekend. Thank you very much for joining us again. Thank you.